Hi, we're going to talk about some ideas for how to read Mary Rowlandson. She can be a tough read. She can sound uh, racist and religiously dogmatic and uh, even cruel and alienated at times. And yet when we put her in her cultural and historical context, it's pretty extraordinary what she accomplishes. And this narrative gives us a really interesting insight into sort of a regular Puritan's view of the world. She's not a theocratic leader of the colony, although she is married to a minister. She's um, a, a relatively priv privileged woman, but she's not a, a leading Puritan thinker or writer. Uh, and, and, and so that gives us an interesting kind of perspective on the Puritan mindset. We need to remember it's a captivity novel. It's a war story. Uh, and it's very tightly linked to justifying what we're later going to recognize as early American westward expansion, uh, the appropriation of Native American uh, lands and the destruction of Native Americans who refused to turn over those lands. We're also going to see a lot of evidence of two major aspects of Puritan culture that we've been talking about patriarchy, uh, which is sort of the m idea of male rule in the case of Puritans linked to the male as a parallel to God on the level of the family and the community, and theocracy, the linking of religion and politics uh, in, in a culture. So look for those ideas and see how they inform this narrative as you're reading it. We also really want to think about the Puritan imagination here, which I've been arguing is a very literary one, because in their quest for assurance, Puritans are always asking the question, what do these signs mean? They're always reading the signs of life around them. What, what does this war mean? What does the early what do the early victories of the Native Americans mean? Is this a sign that we are not among God's elect? Is this a sign that we have not been chosen? What is God trying to tell us? What message should we read from the signs of this war? Certainly when they later triumph in the war, the Puritans will see this all as a sort of divine validation of their mandate. But what's interesting about Rowlandson is we're hearing her reflect on an early part of the war where the Puritans aren't doing so well and the natives seem to seem to be able to survive and attack at will. And she is, of course, baffled by this because it raises questions of what does this say about her relationship with God and her people's relationship with God. So keep an eye on uh, the language, the, the invocation of scripture, the imagery, the symbolism, all in this quest to read the signs, interpret the signs that God has sent. Now, just like everything we read in the course, there the tool of looking at tensions in American culture is very valuable here. If you look at this list, most of them are things we've already been talking about. So I would like to highlight um, the second one, which is uh, really important in early American culture and becomes increasingly important as we approach the Civil War. And that's a tension between um, intellectual reason and religious faith as a way of understanding the universe. And I think you're going to see that Rowlandson relies on religious faith to a point where it can be a little maddening as a reader. And yet, her, her reason is kicking in and struggling and pulling at some of the faith-based attitudes and uh, racist views of the world that she has from her religion. And so almost against her will, she's her, her intellect engages and calls into question and complicates some of those ideas in the text. It's fascinating to look for those moments where she's asserting her re religiosity, but her own basic raw intellectual intelligence is sort of including ideas that question or complicate that. The other thing that's worth noticing here, the last two with this theme of the individual and her or his relationship with the community. And it's worth thinking about where Rowlandson stands in this Native American community, where 
uh, and where Rollinson stands in the white Puritan community and her place with those and her struggle between her individual quest for survival and her role in both of those communities. And finally, we, we, we start to have what will be a very intense conversation this semester about family in America and how we represent family in our literature. And in particular, the ways that family is often liberating and empowering, but at the same time constraining uh, and, and, and limiting. And so look for that in Rollinson. As, as a mother, in what, in what ways does her role as a mother uh, empower her, liberate her, keep her alive? In what ways does it hold her back, limit her uh, understanding and her ability to make sense of all this? All right, I hope those ideas give you something to work with. Have fun. It's a challenging text. Make sure you break it into small pieces. It doesn't look as long as it is, so give yourself plenty of time. See you in Blackboard.